introduce our special guest presenter, Davy Chen. Thank you, Lisa. Um, hi, uh, my name is David Chen, and I will be talking to you guys today about the what it's like working at studios of various sizes, uh, from say corporate up to to small studio to a small startup. How to target each, and what you can expect working at each of those kinds of studios. I'll go over my experiences working on each level and all that stuff. So after I graduated from SCAD in 2011, I did a lot of moving around, going where the job goes and desperate for a good source of income so I could be comfortable being an artist in the entertainment industry. Uh, I started with some freelance. Oh, thank you. And then eventually I wound up in Fisher Price up north, which was a part of Mattel, which is a huge corporate entity in the toy market. LinkedIn says they about have about 900 employees. And I believe that because I barely knew anyone outside my department while I was working there. And I worked on that I worked on that as an animation concept artist for a small group rebranding old IPs for newer audiences. And after I did that for a little bit, I moved down to Houston where I found myself at a reverse outsourcing ad agency called Softway Solutions. And when I was hired, they were just starting up. They started, they were based in Bangla, what was it? Bangalore, India. And they started the Houston branch in 2003. So I joined about the eighth and ninth year in. And they were kind of small, so it was around like 50 people. So it was, it was interesting to go from a really big corporation down to a really small kind of startup feel. And it got ramped up really fast. Like when I, when I left, it, they, were, they had just doubled within the span of months. It was crazy. But I did, I did leave uh, after a little bit, moved down to Atlanta where I worked in television for two shows. I worked for Bento Box and animated on The Awesomes for Hulu. And then I worked on Chosen for Floyd County for the season that it was in production. After Chosen was not going to be renewed for a second season, I ended up joining the rigging team at High res which is where I am today. And that studio has grown to about 350 people. And Bento Box and Floyd County were about at capacity at around 100 people. So most of these studios were different in how they were operating based on the scale of their operations. So their philosophies differed from, say, a small startup's motivations were different from a corporation's motivations in terms of what they wanted artists to do and how they went about making artists do what they needed to do. So it can sometimes be frustrating figuring out how to tap into that, how, how to put your name out there for the corporation or the studio that you want to go for if you're not sure what, where to start in terms of uh, how, how do I, who do I contact, how do I get the information I need and so I'm going to tell you a bit about each one. I'm going to go through and talk from what you need uh, as constants, being an artist in a career, and then I'm going to go through each tier of studio as I go along. Okay. Yeah, so for the first essential baseline, freelancing is very important. And this I say that because it's something that every artist needs to be able to know how to do because if, you're, if you find yourself suddenly out of a job and you've worked straight out of school into a, into a studio of a certain size, it can be quite a shock if you're not sure how to go about finding jobs. So some tips I have are to always be promoting yourself. 
So there's a lot of platforms online now to increase your presence as an artist in the industry that you want to be in. So there's Patreon, there's Tumblr, you can post your work on Etsy, ArtStation, conventions, Twitter, Facebook Live, Twitch, YouTube. The more you put online of yourself, of your work, the more new things you put online, the more you will be able to draw people in. They'll take an interest in your work and then they'll say, wait, there's this guy that's just putting on, putting out all of this content. What's, what's he about? Why are so many people following him? Why is he so popular? And that's important in attracting the people you want to work for, people that want your work to be a part of their design. So your greatest asset is your content. Choose the pieces that you want to put online to show what you can do. A lot of companies actually, if you were the head of a studio of any size, the first thing you want is, an, is a worker that can just fit. So you go online and you look for people, popular artists, and then you see, well, this guy's geared towards making sci-fi things. This guy is geared towards making cartoon whimsical things. It's very, it'd be very hard pressed to find someone going to the cartoon, cartoonist style and asking for something sci-fi. So while it's good to diversify what you want to do, have a focus. Have a theme that is consistent and instantly recognizable. So some tips for the freelancer is to manage your budget wisely. Money can t get tight during dry seasons, so make sure when things are going smoothly you always keep track of your spending. You have, there's a lot of resources that you can use, that, a lot of apps you can use to help track your spending, your time management, your money management, so that way you can be on top of your on top of your, all of your things. So there's things like FreshBooks, LegalZoom, um, and all these other things will help you. So LegalZoom will help you make invoices, they'll help you on the law side of things, being a freelancer, you're one person. So it can be really overwhelming if you end up out in the freelance world and you don't know what to do. So there are a lot of resources that you can tap into that will help you become more successful. They get easier. And always put aside a third of your money for self-employment tax because when tax season comes around, that's something that I learned that if, you, if you're considered self-employed, it will take a chunk out of your budget. And if you don't account for that early on, it will affect you very heavily. And also another thing is to take care of your health, both mentally and physically. Healthcare is a big one for freelancers because they're not going through an employer, which can negotiate healthcare deals for you. So you're kind of end up stuck with a personal healthcare plan, and that can be really expensive and that can really bite into your budget. So make sure you're giving yourself enough time and space for not just your projects, but also for you. So some, I know some people that have done freelance and they just sit in their house, they become homebodies. And it's really frustrating when you get up and then your office is right, right there. So one way I know some freelancers have prevented going stir crazy or cabin fever is they rent out an office space. They have a two bedroom apartment where literally they physically separate themselves from their workspace. Because after a while you tread that same path and you will start without social interaction, without having a physical place to set your professional mind at, you'll start losing track of what is work and what is not work and then it can really it can it can 
can be really frustrating. Make sure you invoice everything with your clients. Uh, this is especially true if you have a difficult client. Get in the habit of keeping track, keeping paper trail of everything that you do for a client. You can have a, you can have a client that looks promising and you're like, oh, we're friends, it's fine. I'll just be like, I'll do one revision off the books, it's good. And then they come back and they turn into something of a monster. And before you know it, you are unable to get that time back. It's gone. So invoice everything. Keep everything professional, even if it's, especially if it's friends. Because in some, some people just want free stuff. And it's not anything about them, it's just they, all, they have budgets as well. So it, it'll work out evenly for both parties if there are documents tracking everything. So with all of that uh, being said, um, freelancing can be really fun if you're that type of artist that thrives on working by yourself. If you, if you like to start a project and finish a project by yourself. If you don't like to, if you like to have creative, full creative control and full time, full management of your time, freelance is definitely something that a lot of people, a lot of freelance, freelance is definitely something that a lot of artists that don't like the studio models do. Just know that it's, it can be hard for some people than others. And now we have the internal startup or the reverse outsourcing studio. I, did, I wanted to go over startups in general, but I don't really have that much experience talking about an official startup, which is about gathering, um, what is it, Sp sponsors, gathering angel investors and all that stuff, and then selling. I, I don't know anything about that. I just know about the internal startup, which is having a parent corporation seed something of a, either an internal group of people to grow another division, or in, in my case, reverse outsourcing studio, where there's a small seed of people apart from main headquarters being put in the States to basically put a more familiar face with clients. If you don't if you don't play well with the five to ten people in your startup, it can be really bad because that's it. That's all you got. Your your band of brothers, your your small collective. If if there's infighting there's there's a lot of responsibility on each person being such a small startup studio that everyone needs to be able to get along with each other, at least on a professional level. It is a small operation, it is high risk, and there will be a lot of hats you will be wearing. And the advice I can give you is to keep track of your responsibilities as you're being tasked. That way you can put that on your resume, it's great resume material to say that you worked at a startup that is successful because to be there in the beginning of a project, to be there at the beginning of say a creative studio that ends up growing to a great size, it's definitely some accolades. A startup is great for flexing your creativity. It's. Uh, you definitely have more control, so it's kind of like doing freelance, but you have friends. So you get to, you can kind of delegate the tasks to each person rather than just keeping it all one, funneling it all through one person. And certain startups go big enough to be bought out or they fold, as most startups are, tend to do, or they get merged in with another with another startup and then they become like a stronger studio or they, they collapse or whatever, yeah. 
and so the startup is not it, it will it, it will continue to grow either way if you want I guess this is from a business standpoint if you want your startup to continue you can't constrain it the scale of production will always be going up if, if you get more work so if, say you have so when I was working at Softway, we had we had around two apps, two mobile apps being developed, and then we had a program with Rice University, where we kind of did educational animation for high school students, and that was fine for a while. And management was pretty happy with the group because we had such a good chemistry that they were like, oh, it's fine, we have a few more clients, but we're just going to give you, we're not going to hire new people because we like this composition so much. And it ended up being really frustrating because we had more projects, but the same amount of people. And try as we have to delegate everything, it got really, it got into a frenzy really fast. And suddenly, you're pl and suddenly management is playing catch up. They're hiring people left and right. And suddenly you have imbalance in team chemistry. And that's one of the struggles of, one of the struggles that I faced working at Softway was that it was really hard being in such a fast, quickly growing work environment. Turbulence and growing pains will occur at a small startup simply due to the nature of them being kind of like a seed that kind of grows. Management, a good management team at a startup knows how to scale, to, how to grow the tree, basically. If you grow it too fast, it can turn off a lot of artists because there's a certain stability in a work environment that needs to be maintained. If you come in one day, or if you leave one day with your computer and the cubicle, and you come back tomorrow, and your computer is in a box in the corner because they didn't have enough time to order a new cubicle for you, but they needed the new person to start immediately. It can be really, it can completely throw off the, the workflow in that no one's getting the things they need all the time to get the work that they need to deliver. Expect growing pains. This type of Studio is great if you want creative control really quickly. So, if you start, if you start a startup with a friend, suddenly you're calling half of the shots. So you can make all the creative decisions with one other person to go through. It. And that's great. That's great if you're looking for. That, that's great for leadership. That's great on your resume. That's great for the startup. But know that as as you grow, it will only exponentially your responsibility will ex exponentially scale as well. So be aware of be aware of the growth in your company and try to keep that in check before it goes too crazy. So one of the reasons why I left Softway was because it got when you add 30 employees within the span of a month a lot of things get misplaced and suddenly you a smaller space meant to hold 20 people suddenly gets thrown crazy because now you have 50 people in the same small space and there's no space to actually put anything physically it was really hard and mentally it was really hard because yeah you, you have you have HR coming in and telling you this policy's changed, that policy's changed. When, when you first join, you agree to a certain set of policy. You get certain benefits, you get certain perks. Suddenly, all of that is being juggled by the management because they're not sure how to assign budgets now that 30 people just got pulled in, but they need to put all these people to work. So they start slashing everything, they start reassessing every everything that you sign up on this job for, so watch out. It's good, start, growth is good for a startup, but too much growth without proper management can be really dangerous. So that being said, we, we go into the small business, the local studios. So after, say a startup has grown, 
remarkably well. It's got a steady show, and now we're hitting to a point where you start, faces start to not be so familiar, but you still, you're still a nice, nice community of people, around 100 people. So you, you, do, you do see the same faces every day, but you do need a bigger space. Something that's, in my experience, has always been the case with small business studios is there's only a certain budget to keep a certain number of permanent people on staff. This usually is the people that started the company and then as they grow with the, with the company, they get to stay on based simply because they do their job well and they have good history. So yeah, there's a lot of familiar faces that you'll see, you'll recognize because, yeah, they're the faces. Like you go to Floyd County, you'll know, oh, I know who Jamie is, I know who Adam Taves is, I know who all these people are, because they've been with the company for a long time, and obviously it's a part of that company. Uh, most small businesses hire freelance or contract on certain seasons, certain to seasonal workers, you could say. Because a small studio is limited in its budget, more, lim I guess, less and limited than a startup, but definitely have a, a smaller pool of budget than, say, a larger studio. It, they usually look for local talent, because they can't afford to fly out candidates. They can't afford to fly out a great concept artist from LA just to talk to him or her and then decide they don't want them. That's a lot of funds that's kind of being, that's a lot of risk. An easier, an easier thing would be for a local studio to just say, hey, let's put the call out locally and see what artists we can, what hands we can get in the studio to do the work that we need them to do. So a few tips for that. Get the name of your of the HR department manager at the small company you want to work for. Because it's a small studio, you can probably attach a face to a department. You probably know this animation department for this show is one person. HR is probably one person. The studio is the studio founder is probably two or three people. If you know these names. They probably won't change for a while. Not unless the studio starts to grow to the point that they want to hire new people to manage. And that's, not, that's another thing with start small studios is if it gets to a point where you start hitting 100 people, the dynamics begin to shift for a small studio because they start to question, there's too many people. Should we hire more people to replace permanent staff or to help permanent staff? Then you can rob problem with money, where do we have enough money to cover new permanent staff? In essence, upward mobility is very difficult at a small studio simply because in order, it's hard to grow if you don't have enough projects. And if you're operating, if you're operating one or two projects, that give you a certain set budget, you can only have a certain number of permanent people on staff, and then the rest are seasonal workers. The dynamic can be hard if you stack another project, and then you have to, and then management has to start wondering if they need to add more permanent people. Good management at a small studio company will be able to factor that in and be able to hire accordingly. But if it's a small studio that's been going for a long time, chances are there might be some resistance in permanent staff in terms of increasing the number of people. Because it's a small studio is like, oh, we have a group of friends, we have a collective now. Do we want to add another person into our group? Because they're going to be doing around, they're going to be hauling around the same responsibilities as we are. We've been here for 17 years, and then why do we want to hire this three? three-year three veteran from another company just to manage another project that we've been doing for like 15, 17 years. So there's a lot of decisions that have to be done 
management-wise as to how they want to expand, and sometimes that can stall a small studio, and the studio can cap out. Another thing that small studios struggle with is because of budget constraints, sometimes things like equipment might not be up to date because they have to consider budget for infrastructure, expansion, as w and ha have to account for that in the budget that they are given with their two, pro two or three projects. So expanding is really hard when you already maxed out your budget. This is something that management has to struggle with and it trickles down to the artist because then the artist has to wonder, well, why can't I move up? I've been with a company for four to five years now. I keep coming back. Why can't they take me on full time? Why can't I get more benefits? And this, the answer simply is that management is trying to keep their own boat afloat. So you just need to be aware if you're working at a small studio of these growing factors and be aware of the climate of the culture that you're in and yeah, just just know just just know what you're getting into. The titles at a small studio matter less than the money. Freelance is freelance. So do what you're responsible for, what project you work on, because that is what matters. Outside of that studio, people won't be asking, oh, I see you were a background artist on this show. What did you do exactly? They'll look at your backgrounds first, and then they will ask you about your job after. There is no sense of loyalty in freelance. Don't feel attached to the studio you're freelancing for. As I mentioned before, because of budgetary constraints or any other various factors that can happen, either it be office culture, it could be politics, that you just find yourself suddenly stumbling into, at the end of the day, they're, working, they're looking to get the work done. So network, make friends, but never only ride on the hope that your friends will get you jobs. I've seen a lot of people, I've seen a lot of friends in the industry hanging on after they've been let go from a contract because the studio keeps tantalizing them with the care of saying, come back next time and we'll make you permanent. Or come back next time and we'll give you a raise. In term, I would say in terms of a contract worker for a small studio, consider each season, like each term that you're hired on as that as a season, as a term. Renegotiate your rates and be aware of how much more you can ask for. And if they're able to if they're unable to meet that, know that there are other studios out there that are looking. Because if you throw yourself into this I call it a time trap. If you throw yourself into this time trap hoping that the studio will come through, it can be really hard because there are a lot of factors that you're, aren't dependent on you. That, but they know that they can, but one thing that they do know is that they will be able to exploit you if you let yourself be exploited. So another thing that's useful if you are a contract worker for a small studio, I keep coming back to this because I was a contract worker at a small studio. Um, unemployment, there's a sense of, it's like an unspoken sense of shame with some people about unemployment. Like, I know, I know a friend that after we, we were both let go at the same time after uh, a project and she was like, I'm just not, I don't want to do unemployment because that sounds like oh, food stamps or it just, I don't need help. I have enough money right now, I can just hold off until the next season. 
but unemployment during an off season can be beneficial to you. Since you're being let go due to lack of work, they didn't have work for you, it's on them and you can start your unemployment as soon as they give you that notice and it can help you bolster your funds while you search for a job. It's, it's, it's working with you, they're basically paying you to look for a job while you're, while you're in the off season. Just one thing to keep in mind though, if you do apply for unemployment, is that it will come out of your taxes in the future. So I took unemployment after I got let go, and then the year after, I had to pay taxes when I was employed, as opposed to getting the refund I always get. Because uh, they were like, oh, you use unemployment benefits, so now you have to pay for it. Are you paying just income tax on that though, or are you paying the back? I've never claimed, so oh, I don't oh. know how it works. It, it's a part of your income tax. It, it's, you're just paying your fair share. Yeah, you yeah, any other, yeah. The IRS wants to reach in your pocket, no matter what. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So use unemployment to your advantage as a tool. Don't think of it as some sort of social stigma that because in the end you need that you need having an extra cushion can really help you stretch out if you do need to stretch out during a dry season and that being said we'll move into mid-level and corporate the bigger the company the more likely they'll look for specialists because with a mid-level to a corporate there will be already a lot of people we're talking like 300, 500, 700, 1,000. So everyone has a little piece, everyone's a little gear in the machine of corporate. So they're probably not looking for someone who, this is the, I guess, I had a mistake of applying to some corporate companies when I first graduated saying I'm a generalist. Unless it's an internal startup within the company looking for a specific someone to wear a lot of hats. They're probably looking for someone that's more specific, as in, oh, we're looking for specifically a blend shape sculptor. We're specifically looking for a hard surface modeler. We don't need you to do concept art. We don't need you to do UVs. We have a UV artist for that. We're looking for a 2D character facial setup artist. We're not looking for just a 2D rigger. We need someone who's more specialized. So if you're working for corporate, if you want to target a corporate company, it's good to hone your craft down to a fine point because they're looking for sharp knives, in, in essence. Things move slowly in a, in a corporate environment. So if you apply at a big company, expect it to take two to three weeks before they get back to you. Well, this is my experience. Um, when I applied for Fisher Price, I thought, oh, hey, what, what have I got to lose? And they contacted me like a month later, saying, hey, we need you to start. Can you start in three weeks? And that's just, that's just basically because it has to go through a lot of hands. The, your application has to go through a lot of departments with a lot of people. But but they but they do take care of you in the long in the in the short term. They have as the thing about corporate is that uh, everything is standardized in a sense. So after my interview with Fisher Price, they're like, oh do you want to answer a survey about the quality of your interview? <laughs> and that was the same when um, I talked to Blizzard. They were like, oh do you have some minutes to spend after your interview to talk about your interview process was speedy enough. Were we? Were we? Were you compre? Were, did you feel that your feedback was comprehensible? Did you feel like you had enough attention? So they put a lot of these systems in place because it's such a big company. They need to know where they can be more efficient. Because everything is so big, any way they can cut down on efficiency means more money saved for them. So don't assume that HR knows every department personally because it's corporate 
it's very unlikely that one person knows everyone. Big companies have a lot of recruiters that have training on how to spot strong candidates. So they get the baseline knowledge, so they can ask, they can ask you questions like, oh, so I see that on your resume you did 3D character rigging, or I see on your resume you did 2D character rigging. Which programs did you use? That's about, they're gonna ask you these type of questions because they're gonna forward this information to the, the department's responsible. They're, not, they're probably not gonna ask you about, oh, how did you do this face morph? Or how did you do that smear in this program? They're probably not as technical as that. They're not gonna ask you any coding questions unless they're a specific coding recruiter. And, well, that's, that's another breed of recruiter. Um, so one, one thing that stands out if you do the freelance thing where you put all of your work online, increase your exposure and popularity, is you have headhunters that are from corporate, they will actually, that's what their job, they actively scour the internet and scour conventions looking for very talented people. A term they use at high res is rock stars. So they're looking for rock stars, they're looking for uh, yeah, they're looking for people with really strong web presence that can pull a lot of popularity in. But that happens very rarely. Rarely, I had a friend that uh, used to work at EA. She was contacted by a headhunter to work at another corp corporation simply because she put something on Vimeo or she had a Twitter work in progress animation and they, the headhunter sent that to their animation department and their animation department was like, this is exactly what we're looking for in our next game. How much do you want? Suddenly you have the leverage. So just keep doing what you're doing and if a headhunter sees it, that's great. Expect multiple rounds of interviews. So, when I interviewed with Fisher Price, I actually had three rounds of interviews. So they were, it was first the HR department, and they called to ask me some vague questions about my resume. And then the resume gets sent on to the animation team. And then the, I, get, I get interviewed by the manager, phone interview, and then I get flown in for an in-person interview. So the awesome thing about corporate is that they will accommodate for you as, because, they have, because they're a big company and they have a lot of funds. They, they can afford to fly people in from, they can get that concept artist from LA to their studio and then decide they don't like them. And that helps them improve their interview process. If you look at it as practice, I don't know. It's kind of it's kind of twisted to think of it that way. But I remember when I interviewed with High Res, the interview process was it took a whole day. I started at around eleven in the morning and didn't finish around three because there's so many people. You get they want to make sure you're the perfect fit, but there's so many people. So you get interviewed by the, the head of your department, you get interviewed by you, the supervisor that will be supervising you, you will be interviewed by your potential co-workers, and it's a very standardized process, but you, it can wear you out. It just goes on, and you have to explain sort of the same things to everyone because everyone's kind of not on the same page. Be aware that at a bigger company, you, you have all this you have to walk around this huge mass as opposed to like a small studio where you can just be, you can just approach a person head on and get the answers you need. Be aware that you will not be the only one making decisions in your creative work. They're probably putting you there as a gear in the machine. So if you're a blend shape sculptor, you do get to be a part of that sculpting brows, making expressions, but keep in mind that what you, what you want 
will not be what corporate wants. And that's not on your ability. It's, on, it's just on what they want. So if we have a couple of executives saying, oh, she should, she should have a higher smile, then do that. <laughs> it's not because you, you sculpted it wrong. It's simply because someone higher up decided that they wanted it that way. You will very rarely be able to use all your skill set unless the job specifically t says that you will be using your skill set. So this is this is if you get. I had a I had an industry friend that works at Qualcomm, and he worked at in systems for quite a while. But he his major was in animation, so he struggled because. He was like, all I do is just look at code all day and do infrastructure, it's awful. But then he got pulled in, into an internal startup or like, which, which focused on making games to benchmark some of their hardware. And suddenly he said it was like working at a startup but with a corporate backing. So they have all that cash to do anything they want. And he gets to wear many hats, he gets to do Ev almost everything creatively and he loves it and that's just what the job description is so usually the corporate job qualification description section will be exactly what you'll be doing use corporate footprints to your advantage so because a corporate studio is so big they will have a lot of paper trails so if you look at Glassdoor, there's usually a lot of salary information. If you look at LinkedIn, there's usually a lot of goings on as to who the, re who the people are in charge currently, or what the studio is currently doing. They, corporate likes to send out a lot of splashy news to hype up everyone in the company to keep people on the same page, and that usually leaves a lot of paperwork. So you can, you can trace that back just by using the internet. Or you can, tell, you can talk to people that have worked in the same company before because most likely things will not have changed. It's, it's kind of the same at a small studio, I guess, where the people don't change, but a lot of things can change based on production. Whereas in corporate, the faces will change, but everything, the system kind of takes priority. The system is set in place. So, with a corporation, you get a lot of short-term perks. You get a lot of long-term perks. You get stuff like, oh, you get a cereal bar. Oh, you get a cushy nap room. Or, oh, you get a nice, you can get a gym next door to your office. You can get a corner office, whatever. Yeah, all that stuff. All of that is good, but don't expect all of that to be helpful to you in the long run. Look for things like education stipends. Look for things like vacation times. Look for things like classes and why they offer them. Are they looking to grow you as an employee or are they just looking to use you for your work? Google has a lot of perks, like a gym and they had like energy shots next to like, like they had a smoothie bar next to the gym, and then you could have like free equipment rentals. You could basically just go up and take whatever Google equipment you wanted. You had like patios, secret rooms, all that, all this cool stuff, transportation shuttles, all that stuff. And it's really great, but what, if you look beyond that, you can see they're actually doing all of this because the work is so demanding that most people can't go home because there's so many things that they have to do that it's much more beneficial for Google to improve the quality of life of people at the studio rather than giving these long-term benefits that take people away from their work. That being said, Google is a great company. They do offer both great short-term and long-term perks, like they have great vacation and all that stuff. But, and yeah. All of these tiers of studios have a lot of common threads 
there's a lot of things you need to worry, you, a lot of things you need to know when approaching these studios that are really common, some, some ground level stuff, I guess. Some important things to know when you are looking at a studio you're looking, when you're looking at a studio to get hired at, is ask if the hardware or software is updated regularly. If their infrastructure is not being updated regularly, it might be a yellow flag to say, either they don't have enough budget or they don't want to grow as a studio, they just want to maintain, which means they just want to survive. And that can be dangerous for, especially if you want to grow as an artist, it can be dangerous because you're suddenly stuck in like a sand trap because it doesn't move. Research a company's turnover rate. A high turnover rate is a red flag. It's the same if you were to go to a restaurant or if you go to any other business. If employees are quitting constantly after a couple of weeks or a couple of months, it says more about the company than it does for the employees. If you know someone that's being hired at a studio and you know that they are very good artists and people and they end up quitting, I should say something at least about what the studio is and who the person is and all that stuff. Uh, another thing is to don't be afraid to share salary information. I cannot stress this because I see, I remember, I, yeah, still a thing, still a thing that goes on every day right now. Um, I see it in all levels. A lot of people are afraid to talk about salary because the work culture is saying, oh, you shouldn't talk about your salary. That's shameful to just tell people how much you make. But you need to share your salary and the employers don't want you to talk about your salary because that means that they have the benefit of the doubt. They can say, oh, we're treating everyone equally. We're paying everyone straight across the board all the same. And then you figure out the person that was hired next to you he's being paid like 3,000, 4,000 more than you. And he started like three weeks ago. So then because the work culture is that you can't talk about it, you wouldn't have known about it. And then now that you do know about it, you can't talk to the boss about it because the boss would be like, why are you going around asking people what they make? So don't be afraid to share that because there is no law saying that you cannot talk about your salary information. In fact, I think everyone knows about the antitrust lawsuit that just happened out in uh, out California with, with Disney and Pixar and all that stuff. Wage fixing is really beneficial for employers because they can keep the, keep the rates low. But because people don't talk about the salaries, it's really hard to be able to fight that so the first step to fighting that is being more transparent about what everyone's making. On, on the flip side of that, you do not need to disclose your salary employee, salary history to your employer, sorry. And this is something that's, that was a practice, it's been a practice for a while, it's still going on. It's, uh, it's like when you go on and when you go to a corporate website like EA, I don't know if they do that anymore, but you fill out all your work information, previous work, and then they say uh, annual salary, and then you have to put it, otherwise they don't let you proceed to the next one. You shouldn't have to put in your salary because that gives them the power to say, oh, you were poorly paid, they will tell you that, but you were poorly paid at your last job. So to you, if we just increased it by 5000 we save a lot of money because our standard was going to be like, I don't know, 10, 15000 more as a base rate. But because your work history has your salary as low, we're going to keep it low. You don't have to disclose that to, your, to the employer you're trying to work with. And if they demand that you do, the law is on your side. And that speaks more about them as a company than you as an artist. And yeah, it's crucial that you understand what the studio is responsible for versus what you are responsible for. One thing I'll mention is workers' compensation. So a business has to accommodate for disabilities. 
And this includes things like providing proper workplace resources, like ergonomics, for example. If you get something like a nagging wrist while you're drawing, if you're working long hours and suddenly your hand starts to cramp up while you're drawing, keep documentation of that. Email your HR. Keep a tracking, keep a trail going. Because if they do work with you to provide you the things that you need, to say, hey, we'll buy you a wrist rest, we'll buy you whatever you need to get your hand in a proper place so that you're comfortable working, if they can do that, then great. But if they refuse to do that, you can file a workers' compensation form independently to the Department of Labor. So, because if your wrist starts to get worse, if you start to get repetitive stress injuries, if you start to get carpal tunnel, I see this a lot. I saw this a lot in production. I still see it. People are saying, oh, my wrist hurts, but I'll just stretch it a little. And then three weeks later, oh, my wrist is so painful, I can't draw with it. You have a right. If you, if you contracted that wrist from working, you have a right to resources. You have, you work, your work should be paying for your healing, and they should be offering you things like, oh, do you need time off to heal if it gets that serious? I, I say that because I developed a um, golfer's elbow while I was working uh, at, on a production, and the HR was of that company was kind enough to work with me and say, oh, we'll hire, we'll get an ergonomist in to take a look at how your workspace is set up. We'll get you some things to, we'll get you a sit-stand desk to help with your uh, posture. And they were great in facilitating with that. And this should be the same no matter what studio you work at, no matter what scale. Because th th these are essential, important things. This is your life that you are this is, these are your hands, these are your tools that, that they are paying you to use. And if it breaks, they should, they should fix you. Or at least give you some compensation. A business cannot fire you because you developed an injury. The other way around, the other way that can happen is if your supervisor comes up to you and says, you haven't been delivering your shots on time. And then you say, oh, but I have carpal tunnel, I can't draw as fast. And then later on, a couple of weeks later, you get fired for another unrelated reason. If you have documentation and you strongly suspect that it wasn't any other thing, that's something that you can go to work as comp about. Never, tell, never say to yourself that I'm sacrificing myself for the studio because they're my family. Like I said earlier, freelance is not loyal. The studios that want to keep you will try to create a nice work culture. They'll try to create a nice family atmosphere. But in the end, if you're on contract, what matters is the quality of your work, not how late you stay. If you work at a studio that says, oh, everyone should stay late today because the supervisor's staying late today, that's a yellow flag that you should consider because that doesn't mean that anyone is worked, working harder by staying longer. It could, actually, it could also mean that the supervisor is actually really behind and they just want to make their team stay so they can finish the work faster. The supervisor can finish his work faster. So they can rest the team stay behind to finish his work. Then it becomes... Then people can get disgruntled because these employees are wondering why they're staying longer. But they feel like they have to because the pressure is so great. Everyone at work is staying later and now I feel bad. Know that there's a balance of, try to maintain a balance of work and life. Once you get into a hazardous environment, you can be stuck in what I call a time trap. So, I had this scenario written out, but I think I just went over it a little. So your supervisor gets stressed out because there's not enough, because the producer didn't set enough ass, uh, didn't, the producer didn't set enough time for the asset delivery. 
so your supervisor gets stressed out and forces everyone to stay an hour. And the work continues to pile up because of the understaffing. But you deliver everything on time. You just stay over it. You just stay over the weekend to get your to get the things in. The producers are celebrating because they were able to squeeze the timeline and deliver on time. But your supervisor and you didn't take overtime pay because that would look bad on budgets. You have a growing you have a growing resentment inside you because you that's a weekend that was yours. It's your time. But you, you sacrifice it because you want to look good or so they can hire you back. I don't know, whatever reason. Because it's artist integrity to suffer. I don't know, whatever reason you give yourself. And, and, then, sudden, and then at the end, the content is released and it gets received poorly because the quality was awful. Because it was rushed. And then every, now everyone is mad. The producers are mad, the supervisor is mad, you're mad. Because why, why did this go wrong? We've worked so hard. And the cycle continues. If there's no addressing that, if, if you don't, it starts with you. If you don't stand up for yourself and say, I'm done with my work, that's it. Then your supervisor won't tell their producers we're doing qual everything is getting done. All the responsibilities are being filled. We just need more time. Then it falls on upper management because they're the ones that are allocating the budget and that includes time, that includes money. So it's not up to you to kind of flex your schedule to fix their mistakes. This fatigue, this cycle, will continue because you'll go home angry. You'll go home short on your own time. You won't be able to work on the projects that you want to do so you can get a better job at the place that you want to go. It will trap you because every day, every week that passes, every day that passes that you do this, you stay a bit later every day, you don't get to work as much, you go home tired, that fatigue from working in that toxic environment will trap you because then you'll be stuck in this constant cycle of, oh, I made it home, I want to work on my stuff, but I'm so tired because I worked late. And then suddenly you've thrown off your motivation because all you're doing now is working and you don't even like the work that you're doing now because you're being pressured to do it and you have to meet these insane deadlines. This is how people burn out. And I've seen it a lot. It's either by, th either they get a physical injury and the long hours continue to push them and they just, t they just get so jaded, they turn away from the industry because it's like, I have nothing to show for it. I haven't moved up. All I have is this wrist injury that's gonna stay with me for the rest of my life. And, and, this, and this hypertension, and I don't know, smoking, whatever. Drinking problem, I don't know. You don't need any of this resentment. You are the asset to the production, not the studio. The studio needs good workers. So you, and you only have a few professional, you only have a few years in your professional life to work on the projects that you do. Um, I think, what was it, Ken, Ken, Ken Levine from Bioshock? He was the one that said, it's about, picking and choosing which projects you want to work on because you only have a good amount of years to be in this industry before you realize that's it. I can't deal, I can't deal with this. I can't do this anymore. So choose your jobs wisely. Be a part of something that you know you will be able to use in the future. If you do have good work, if you, have good, if you have good work and you're able to show it, if you give yourself the time to make the work that you want to make and you put it out there for everyone to see, you will get noticed. It might, be, it might not be instantly, some people instantly, some people it's like three years, but 
you will get noticed and you will get hired. I has I, I have a friend that worked with me for a while doing storyboarding. She did story she was in the storyboarding department. She suffered through the set, the time trap. It was awful. She got burnt out. She was fired. And she had a whole it was really bad. She had a whole time about it. She had like months of sadness because where else was she gonna work? And uh, Valve contacted her because she had been working on in a comic in her free time. And they liked the way that she, they liked her visual style. So they hired her. Now she's full time at Valve. So don't get so fixated on the work that you lose track of your life goals, which is I assume to grow as artists, to make a mark in the industry. Balance your work and your life. So with healthy jobs, it's possible for producers to keep timeline on track. There should be little to no overtime. Good producers are able to step out and say, we need more time. They're able to account because they know artists need time and need and they should have a good estimate of what each thing takes. Poor scheduling is not the fault of the artist, it's the fault of management. So a great job should keep you should bring you rewards, it should keep you inspired. And you should have professional bosses that aren't trying to refer to you as friends, but as professionals. Because they should respect you, they shouldn't try to like be buddy-buddy. Which is not to say that you can't be friends, but know what works matter. Choose your projects carefully. Uh, study a studio's perks and see, see if they're good for the long run or the short, short term. If they're short-term perks or if they're long-term, don't get too settled. You can always find a better job. With every step that you take, with every job that you take, you get a step into the industry. So don't feel like you have to stay anywhere you don't want to be. If you take away anything from this, just take away that you have rights as a worker. Don't undersell yourself as an artist. And before you take a job, fully understand what you're getting into. The most important thing you have as an artist is your time, which you should be properly compensated for so you can have the energy to maintain your motivation to keep growing as an artist. And depending on the studio that you choose to end up at, know the pros and cons of being at where you want to be. Find the right type of environment for you and you'll find the work and quality of life to be enjoyable and rewarding. That's it, thank you.